Okay, so hopefully everybody can hear us who's logged in. Um, just a few housekeeping rules. Um, we can take questions from delegates who registered for the webinar with the, uh, the Zoom link that we sent out to GIA members. If you're joining us from Facebook Live, it's not as easy for us to take your questions during the webinar. So what we'll do is we'll collect up those questions from Facebook live streaming at the end of this session and we'll try and get answers out to you in a set of FAQs that we'll publish to the industry tomorrow, if that's okay everybody. So, if you are participating via the Zoom link, by all means, put questions into the chat box. Actually might be better, Olivia, do you think? Then we're just keeping our eye on one particular thing, or do you want them more in the Q&A? Um, if they could actually put them in the Q&A box, that would be great. Um, and then we can keep an eye on actual questions to us. And obviously, they can use the chat box for um, any, any other comments or chats. But if anything you want to communicate with us, if you could put them maybe in the Q&A, that'd be great. Brilliant. So chat as much as you want in the chat, but anything you want an answer from specific from, from us, put in the Q&A. If you're watching this on Facebook, we'll soak up your questions later on and we'll use those to form part of our FAQs as well. Can I just say thank you so much to everybody who has sent us in questions overnight. We've collected them together. A lot of them are on the same themes. You've got a lot of common worries between you, obviously, as well. Um, I'm not going to be able to answer every single question that you've got today. I'm not going to be able to give you detailed answers on some of them and no answers at all on, on other questions we've had. So apologies in advance for that if you thought I was going to reveal all the secrets uh, today. What we had planned was that DVSA would be on this webinar with us today, um, but they are still working on communications themselves. So they're not able to attend because they're still working on getting things cleared by central government that they can then send on to you guys as well. But what we have arranged with them this afternoon is NAS, the National Association of Strategic Partnership, was due to have a meeting with them tomorrow anyway with the head of drive policy mark mcgee and their comms teams nasp is having that meeting at 3 30 which i'll be chairing as the current chair of nasp and then what we said is that we'll do a webinar for everybody to join again at 4 p.m with dvsa so you'll have that straight from the horse's mouth you know opportunity tomorrow at 4 p.m the advantage of that as well is they will have more meat on the bones of answers as well because they are, like, you know, we're waiting on DVSA, they're also waiting on DFT for answers and as high up as number 10 for answers as well. Because as we all know by now, we would love to think that when the government makes a decision to increase lockdown measures, they've communicated exactly what that means or discussed it with every government department or every frontline service that's got to adhere to those guidelines or, to, or deliver or not deliver something. In reality, that doesn't happen. So. When, the, when Boris goes on the TV and interrupts the rugby nearly on Saturday, he hadn't necessarily had that chance to work it through all the areas that he should have done in terms of how it's going to work in practice, who it affects, who it doesn't affect from this week. So all that is still tragically being discussed. And that's why we're going to have a, a moving feast of information come out over the next few days. So, you know, I can only apologize from that from, from our point of view, if we don't get information uh, quick enough to you, but it's a lot of it is out of our hands at this moment in time as well. But keep your questions coming in. Um, shall we start off with the main FAQs here, Olivia? I think it's useful just to deal with the things that people have been asking us the, the questions, or just recap on the situation as is at this moment in time. Yeah, so um, maybe do a recap, um, and then what we can do is if anything that you don't cover, then we can go through the main FAQs. Okay, that's what I'll do. So I'm going to go through this in sections. I'm going to look at testing and training in England, then I'm going to look at it in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, and then we'll move on to some financial support measures as well. And um, what I'll do at the end of every section, if that's okay with everybody, is I'll take a pause, and now I don't give many of those away, but I'll, I'll do you all a favour today, and I'm going to let my fellow panellist, Mark Yaffe, who to introduce him, is our Chief Motorcycling Examiner and our Rider Expert. Olivia, if you're not DIA, you might not know her. She's our head of training and a very experienced driver trainer. And if you've never met me before or seen my face on anything, I'm Carly. I'm chief executive of DIA as well. So we'll take it like that, guys. Is that all right? And if I'm saying something wrong, Mark and Olivia, and you've got more up-to-date information than me, 
please contradict me and, uh, and supply the right information as well. Shall okay, we? so just to recap, theory and practical tests are now cancelled up to the 2nd of December in England. So this is England we're just doing at the moment. This includes car, bike and vocational tests. The big question that I'm getting right now coming through on my emails, and also I can see the help desk emails are also getting that, is if all of the normal testing is cancelled, will there still be some provision for critical worker testing? It hasn't been absolutely confirmed to me yet. There is some information on gov.uk that alludes to this, but that information is being updated and correct as we speak but it is my expectation there will be very little critical worker provision this time around. The reason we had critical worker testing available last time is because we had such a lengthy lockdown. Because we're having a much shorter period of lockdown, i.e. four weeks, and that's what we expect at this moment, we've been told no more than you have about whether it will be extended. It's not thought feasible to set up a critical worker testing process in the way that it was last time. So I don't want to get anyone's hope up that, well, I'm not going to be able to do my normal pupils, but I might be able to do some key workers or I've got key workers who have got hopes that they might be able to continue their training. It is thought at this time. And again, I'm going to caveat it. This is my expectation, not necessarily what is a done deal. And these discussions are still taking place with government at this moment in time that there will only be a very, very limited number of critical tests taking place for very urgently needed frontline services that are part of the management of the delivery of services to look after people with COVID. So it won't be the same as last time where a, a range of key workers are able to still be trained and still be tested as well. However, as I've said, that is a conversation that is still taking place at government level at the moment in terms of looking at need and looking at whether there is a, a real need to provide that service. What we've got to think about here is it's a much shorter period. In four weeks, who are we going to be able to train and test the standards to get them through if they're a new worker who's urgently needed in a frontline position? So we have asked the question of DVSA today that even if they don't offer critical worker tests, should we still, in the interests of the other big you know, public health issue, road safety, still be able to continue the training of some critical workers who have got tests just after the lockdown ceases. Because obviously stopping their training for a month and they were expected needed to be tested um, just after lockdown is, is a big question we should ask. I haven't had a response on that at the moment, but I have asked the question. So let me come back to you in the next 24 hours with more clarifications on the, the critical worker question. However, just to reiterate, I wouldn't get your hopes up about being able to deliver training to the range of key workers that we were in the last lockdown. But again, being super careful here, that is, that is, you know, sheer conjecture in a way at this moment, and we're, we're chasing DVSA to confirm that bit of information. You may see some information go up on gov.uk or DVSA direct about this overnight, um, but so keep your eyes peeled for that if we're not able to get it to you in a timely manner. Um, we Another big question that we've got is, okay, Carly, so if you're telling us that all training and testing has been suspended in England for all types of vehicle and all types of license holder, is that going to be a directive from DVSA? Because that was the big problem, let's face it, last time, folks, is there wasn't a clear directive that absolutely banned training. And that allowed you know, some people to continue and, and try and carry on with their livelihood. And some people to be you know, rattling our door and saying, this is ridiculous. I'm staying in and staying safe. Why are these people out on the road and delivering training? So we've asked DVSA if they're going to give that clear directive this time. I've also asked if there is, if that's going to be the case, will there be enforcement? I'm not, I'm not asking for it before everybody starts charging my door to beat me up. I'm not asking for it, but we, we do need to see that if training is effectively halted by a directive from government, is there going to be something that, that polices that? And is there going to be 
an enforcement on one side which the people who don't want to break that rule uh, would support is there a risk therefore that people should know about if they are thinking about going under the wire in some way and still training so we've asked the question again i will come back to you as soon as i can a note that i would make to all trainers in terms of the decisions that they make to train in this lockdown and sub maybe subsequent god help us we don't have that but subsequent lockdowns if there is a directive from the regulatory authority that you should not be training, then insurances such as training car insurances, public liability and professional indemnity may be voided if you choose to train. So if they do issue a clear piece of advice or directive that training should be suspended, you do need to check with your training car insurance provider and certainly our PIPL, they would void cover for that. And most PIPL coverers would because there is a, a part in all the insurance contracts of this nature that says if an authority dictates that uh, there should not be a, any operation of that service, you would be in contravention of that directive. So therefore that voids insurance at that time. So just please, this is for advice. It's not me dictating to you what you do. Please be aware of the risks. If there is that clear directive from government that you should not be training at this time. We are getting emails from people saying, this is ridiculous, I'm going out anyway. All I can say to you is that is at your own risk. And if there is a government directive dictating that, we cannot support that training happening at that time. It's an individual's risk that they take um, on that. I'm very sympathetic to the hardship of people who cannot work at this time. And I've been speaking to the, the Treasury and anybody I think of the business secretaries and more on that in a moment to see if there's going to be any other financial support measures. But you have to weigh up those risks and consequences for yourself um, about that as well. Is that everything on England for the time being in terms of the headlines, Mark and Olivia? Yeah, there's a couple of questions coming in about when training will restart. Re training will, at the moment, restart on the 2nd of December and testing. So uh, there's some doubt about whether it's the 2nd or the 3rd, but it is actually the 2nd that it restarts. So that's for training and testing. There's about four or five questions coming in on the Q&As uh, on that particular topic. So um yeah it, it will be somebody says they've got a test on the 3rd of december um that's absolutely fine because you can start teaching on the second for the tests on the third um i can see there's some questions coming in about the booking system and how they're going to uh, deal with bookings let me go through scotland uh, wales and northern ireland because they're quite short and then i'm going to talk about the the booking system and what likely to happen there if that's all right with people but thanks for confirming that mark because it is confusing you know whether dates are inclusive or not when we first get hold of them and um, in wales as people will already be aware testing and training is suspended until the expected end of the Welsh fire break on the 9th of November. So the Welsh First Minister is saying that he has no intention of extending their fire break beyond that point, but obviously always be prepared for things to change. Um, we are chasing DVSA at the moment on a question we've had from quite a few of you who live over the border in Wales. And you've asked that if there is, um, if the Welsh break their fire break on the 9th of November, are you allowed to go over the border into Wales if you're based in England and start training? So we're asking DVSA to give us guidance on whether that's possible. My own opinion is um, it's possible that you should be allowed to do that. You would be traveling for work, so you wouldn't necessarily be breaking the travel restrictions of the UK lockdown. Um, but you, you know, if Wales is open and you're training genuine Welsh customers, it's possible that that would be okay. But I don't want to be the head on the line for that one. I'd like DVSA to give you guidance there as well. Um, in Scotland, um, we've seen in the media this week that Nicola Sturgeon has admitted that she won't rule out taking Scotland into increased nationwide restrictions. Obviously, there is a variety of levels in operation uh, in Scotland at the moment, but there is chat in the media that they are looking to take Scotland into level four, which would mean effectively that driver training and testing and rider training and testing would halt in Scotland as well. So 
Keep your eye on that situation, Scottish members. It's not been confirmed yet. It's just chat in the media and what that would mean. Um, the other bit of news, obviously, for Scottish trainers is that whilst you are training at the moment, face masks have been made compulsory for all trainers and all testing up there in the, at the moment. So some Scottish PPE firms going to be uh, going to be happy about that. Um, in Northern Ireland, tests scheduled between the 17th of October and the 13th of November have been cancelled. However, after clarifying regulations, rider tests have resumed as long as they are rider tests delivered in a context in which social distancing can actually be allowed. So, Mark, have you got any other updates on the rider testing in Northern Ireland? No, no, no nothing more than you have. No. Okay. On, on the, um, just going to the booking system at the moment, how are all these cancelled tests going to work? It is our expectation at this moment in time that the, um, the all bookings will be cancelled and a little bit like last time, all those candidates who've had their tests cancelled because of this lockdown will receive an email where they will be given a date for a new test or given the option to go into the system and book a test for a later date. So they either take the test that's offered to them or they'll have to book a test probably for a later date as well. I think looking at all the scenarios that DVSA have to consider in this kind of, 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 of lockdown, that, that is the fairest way of doing it is to cancel out everything, and then give people the date soonest after lockdown ends. If they don't want that date, then they're going to have to opt to take a, a date at a different point. So, but that again is not confirmed. That is just our expectation, knowing the scenarios and choices that DVSA are looking at at the moment. That is the most practical system that works in the fairest manner for all concerned as well. Mark, um, Olivia, anything for you to add there or any questions yeah. that you're seeing? Yeah, so uh, in the rider training world, um, customers aren't able currently before lockdown uh, to book their own tests. It's down to the to the approved training bodies, the ATBs, to handle all of the test bookings. If somebody um, wants to book their own test privately, they're being referred by, directly back to an ATB to book the test for them. So my recommendation for ATBs would be to to go and cancel all your tests on the booking system that will save the dvsa a lot of work if we all do it ourselves um, and then manage your test bookings accordingly um, whether you decide to to keep the people that are on uh third fourth second third fourth fifth of december or juggle everybody up four to six weeks it's entirely entirely up to you but um it, it's all down to the atbs in the in the bike world and not individual people have you anything to add from you in terms of questions that are coming in i'm just going through them at the moment um i mean something we're asked is um you know if they've got a test um, uh, coming up, can they go out and practice? Uh, I know that's not quite the, on the the same uh, uh, question, but that that's that's something which you know. I've, someone said oh, I've got standards check um, coming up early December. I can't go out and practice. Um, it's my it's a second attempt. Can I can I go out and do something like that? Um, so those types of questions are coming in. Just so you know, just on the sort of loose um, thing about that. Um, what else have we got? Um, Will um, practical tests be uh, that are affected in November be given any priority to rebook? That's one that's come through. Well, yes. I mean, it, those, those tests that will be cancelled out now will be sent a little bit like last time. The email link. Well, they'll be sent an email with a new test date on it and a link or or some way of booking another date if that first date that's been offered by DVSA doesn't doesn't work for them. So in that sense, they are getting a priority as they should. Um, there has been a question as well from a lot of people is, because uh, obviously the fear is, is if you're not allowed to train people, uh, but parents can because they can go out in the in the car. Are you going to lose business to those parents? Um, and you know, or also, are you you've got the fear that those parents are doing things in training that you wouldn't normally like them to be doing? Um, again, that's a question that we'll ask DVSA: is can you give some guidance on whether practical training, uh, practical uh, 
practice, private practice, that's the word I'm looking for, um, should still continue? Or are you going to advise against that? Real tricky balance there because private practice is considered important to the development of pupils. And if they are from the same household, feasibly they can do that. But again, does it fall under those kind of non-essential journeys, all those kind of things? So we will ask the guidance on that one um, as well for you. Um, so any more questions on the actual tests and training or the booking system for now? Um, standards checks, part two, part three, people are asking about that. So assuming that's all on hold as well. That's yeah, those, are all, those are all on hold as well. Some people will be thrilled to hear that, uh, <laughs> not the part threes, because obviously you want to get yeah. on and, and get your license. Um, but they they obviously had restarted part threes, part twos and standards check uh, shortly before this lockdown. Um, and, you know, it was a clear message from DVSA that, you know, people shouldn't expect not to have one this year and, and relax a little bit. Um, they are trying, they were just about trying to catch up on those, but obviously this will set them back on that as well. But there will be an important onus on recovering time on getting those back on the road again, because it is an important thing to make sure that people are up to standard to deliver training under the license conditions as well. But for now, you know, obviously those are not the absolute priority of the agency. Um, and we'll probably lag a little bit behind, obviously, practical vocational and rider tests once those start running again um, as well. We've had... Um, okay. Oh, sorry, Karen. No, go, you go. We've had um, a few questions about um, like vocational testing and training. So um, obviously testing, we're assuming that's going to be uh, all suspended. Um, there's the fleet trainers saying, can I go out and deliver training to companies and things like that? Um, I don't think that's, that's, they're able to do that, are they? No, I mean, it, it, it's basically all testing. And I've just had a little question from uh, lovely Phil, um, who's not too far away from me. Uh, I'm here in Rygate, he's just up the road. Um, talking about public liability insurance being voided uh, if there is a directive, if there's got to be a directive from government that, that, that the training can't take place. Um, does this have an effect on fleet training in company vehicles and can fleet assessment training continue? Again, if you're worried about the insurance aspect of any of this, you need to contact your personal insurer. Um, PIPL, from our perspective, we, there is a clause in ours that if there is an official directive from government suspending uh, training, then, then the insurance would be compromised. So please do check with, especially if you're training for fleet and they're providing the insurance cover for the vehicles or the trainees, check that you are not putting yourself in an impecunious position because their insurance has been nullified and they haven't checked that yet. So always ask the question in this situation to manage your own risks when training for third parties or in third party vehicles as well, is what I'd say. Yeah. So should we move on now to sources of financial support or pe do people still have questions? I'm just going to recap because I can see some questions coming in, which we have kind of answered. Um, but I think people are joining the webinar a little bit late or at variable times because you're all, you know, kind of busy people. You've got other lives than this. Um, just to reiterate what we said at the top of this uh, webinar, all driver training and all rider training and text weight, all driver testing his is cancelled until the 2nd of December. Um, so that's all licensed categories. That's vocational, that is bike, that is car. Um, and and we CBT. Don't expect and, and, compulsory CBT. Basic, and compulsory basic training as well. Yeah. So basically, if there's a test in a vehicle or on a vehicle, it's been suspended until the 2nd of December. Um, if you... Uh, the booking system... They will notify candidates. They've already started that process. We expect, but have not had confirmed by DVSA that what will happen is that they will send an email to all pupils who've had their, their test canceled in this period with a date for a new test with an option for that pupil to change the test if they have to. What I would say is if we want to get the booking system up and running and flowing again for people beyond that 2nd of December, if pupils can take the test day offered, that makes it easier for people who are further back in the pipeline as well. Other tests and assessments that have been cancelled is all AGI enforcement activity in terms of carrying out part three, part two, and the standards check have also been suspended as well. 
the burning question of can I teach key workers? It is not expected that there will be a capacity of critical worker tests of the nature we saw in the last lockdown. DVSA may provide a tiny, tiny amount of tests for those who have an urgent need who are delivering emergency services only. Um, you know, that, that is still something that is being discussed at the moment, so there is no confirmation of that, but certainly there is an expectation that we won't be able to deliver testing to a range of key workers like teachers, like um, delivery workers and people like that as we were this time. It's because it's a very limited period of lockdown this time, a much shorter period. So to put things into operation for that, it's not gonna make that much difference to people who still have to train and test as well. We have to recap, ask the question that even if there's not going to be many critical worker tests available, would it be possible for people who are critical workers to continue their training if they have a test shortly after this lockdown ends? because obviously the, you know, the public health issue of making sure we adequately prepare people for licensure is still an important one. So I've asked the question of DVSA, again, I wouldn't get my hopes up on that. I think the viewpoint is that you know, all training is going to be suspended basically. And it'd be a very, very narrow percentage of uh, need for those frontline urgent medical services to have people trained if they need to increase capacity to deal with any spikes in cases. We've got- um, So that's just a recap of what we've just talked about. Go on, Olivia. Sorry, we got a few people asking a similar question. Um, will they cancel all book tests or just the lockdown tests? So we're assuming just the lockdown tests at the moment, aren't we? Um, and will yeah. the tests go, and can you confirm that a test on the 2nd of December will go ahead? Well, it's planned to at the moment, yeah. yes. Um, but unless anything, government gives us any guidelines, gives DVSA any further guidance on that. Um, at the moment, yes, that is planned to go ahead, but obviously this changes. So. Um, we need to keep up to date with any changes that might happen between now and then. Hopefully, yes. Exactly. So I am, I am going to say to you people that we can frequently look stupid when we do these kind of webinars in a, in a shifting sands of a, of a crisis in that we can be saying something to you online right now and DVSA might have sent an email out whilst I'm online. And I'm just checking my emails to see what has happened that contradicts everything we say or we can be not saying something that we may have had a briefing on, but then we find out that the BBC has already got hold of it like yesterday, or somebody has updated it on gov.uk, but we just haven't had the email as, as stakeholders yet. So please do forgive us if the, that uh, you find that we've not necessarily uh, given you the most up-to-date information as you would expect. So. Uh, Yes, yeah, so that's it. Anything else you two want to say on the training and, and testing side of things before I move on to financial matters, guys? Um, well, we've got a few more questions. I mean, yeah, let's take those then. Yeah, okay. So um, Hayley's asking, um, got a customer with a test on Friday and obviously lots of ADLs will have pupils with tests over the next sort of couple of days. When will they be notified formally that they've been cancelled? Um, I'm assuming DVSA, I don't know, I haven't heard this unless you have, Carly that they, you will be hearing from them shortly? Or are they assuming that um, because of the lockdown and the messages that they're not gonna get canceled individually? Um, and it's, I think it's gonna be more like that, isn't it? Um, they are gonna be written to to rebook. Two, yes, two messages. I definitely assume that all tests for beyond Thursday are suspended um, and they should shortly hear about arrangements for the rebooking of those tests. It may be that DVSA does send a general email reconfirming what's already been sent out there in terms of the news uh, to, to individual pupils, but certainly they, the next thing they'll probably hear is about the arrangements for rebooking. But as soon as we know that there's some communications going out to pupils, we'll let you know. But normally what happens is DVSA emails all ADIs with a very similar message to what they're going to send out to their pupils as well. But again, keep in touch with your pupils because the cynic in me says that, you know, sometimes people get hold of information before the people who should get hold of the information first do so. So, you know, it's always worth keeping in touch with all channels of information to, to cross check what people have. But also what I would say with that is always fact check what you hear from somebody else. Yeah. 
um, with the official body as no, and we can always check that with DVSA. Because, go on. Uh, yeah, no, we, uh, we've, we've got one coming from Louise Cook about module one and twos on the 2nd and 3rd of December. So, uh, Louise, yeah, you can't start training until the 2nd. Um, as you are uh, in charge of your OBS um, booking system, all I can suggest you do is move them uh, to another day and maybe only take fully trained people to test on the 2nd um because you can't train them you simply can't train them before it's irrelevant the fact that motorcycling is different to to cars the the uh the the instruction is no training before the second so you're just going to have to juggle it um and a lot of atbs are going to have to use the tests that they've got currently booked uh on the second and the third for currently trained staff or retakes uh currently trained customers or retakes so you can't train before the second just a quick uh reiteration on this one um yes theory tests are suspended as well you should have had that notice today or last night was it uh, on dvsa direct if you are not signed up to DVSA Direct for some reason, that then that's uh, a reason to do so because then you're going to get those those messages uh, quite quickly through them when they go out. But yes, uh, theory tests have been suspended as well, and again, they'll be working on a system to rebook those, and we should be notified as to what that was uh, and what that will be. Uh, but later, I'm sure one of the other questions next is going to be, we well, we all wanted the theory test certificates extended after the last last lockdown. Are we going to ask the question of government uh, whether we can you know revisit the question of whether theory test certificates should be extended as well but again I wouldn't be holding out much hope on a, a positive result on that one we can only ask the questions and lobby for it we can't unfortunately wave a magic wand and make it happen so any other burning questions you think we should be answering or anything we should clarify because I speak too quick and people might have missed it um, Bruce has asked, uh, the booking system when it reopened last time didn't give a new test date, they were sent emails to say they can go online, book a new test, um, and um, so we're wondering what's going to be the uh, new process for this one. Do, do we Have we had that clarified yet? That is part of the communications that I know they are working on right now. So as I said at the top of this, we'd hope that DVSA had been able to join us today and, uh, and Mike Warner, their, their comms lead and Mark McGee were going to join us. Uh, but the comms pack, the bit, the thing that has got all the detail in it and the official word from, from them is still awaiting clearance. Um, and they're very frustrated because they want to get it out to you and they want it to be on this webinar and answer your questions as well. So detail like that will be in the comms pack. Now I've been led to believe that will be out either later this evening or it will go out tomorrow morning. So do keep your eyes peeled for your DVSA direct on that. And obviously as soon as we receive word of that, we will get that out as well for people who for some reason don't get the DVSA emails as well. Okay, um, it's just I'm just going through the questions again. Um, one, some, a few people have asked um, because education, um, schools, and colleges are able to continue. Um, they're saying ADIs are also an educator, um, and why can't we continue under the same banner as schools and colleges do? That's quite a popular question. Um, I do, I, I do empathise with, with the, the principle yeah. of that. I, I, yeah, I can understand that. However, you are working, I'm playing devil's advocate here. I'm not, I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with, with either side here. Um, you are in much closer proximity in a, in a much more enclosed environment. You, you can say, well, I've got it ventilated, I've got masks on and things like that. In a classroom, the teacher can socially distance more from the pupils, plus they are ventilating those classrooms as well. Um, so I think that that will be the response. It's not necessarily my opinion, but I think that will be the official response as to why schools are open. Um, and, uh, and, why not. and also, sadly, the perception is that particularly primary education um, and those people are working towards things like GCSE and A-levels is that in some ways more important than the acquisition of the driving license for that for that younger age group again not my opinion this is just what i feel some of the pushbacks on that will actually be i did actually write to the uh 
the chairman of a, a major supermarket chain yesterday in a similar vein, who was offering discounts to teachers on, uh, on, on the groceries. And I did say to them, you should be offering this to other educators at the moment, particularly those who are, you know, kind of risking things a little bit more, working on the roads to keep our roads safe. Um, so I'll see if I can get us maybe some of the similar benefits that are being offered to teachers generally, if we're, as I agree with you, going to cash all educators into the same group, doing a very valuable job. Exactly. Um, just having a little look. We've had, uh, there was another question very similar to, it was like a, someone that lives near the Scottish border in Northumberland. Um, they live about a mile from the Scottish border. Can they um, travel uh, to Scotland? and continue training them. So that will come under similar, um, that would be a similar response, I think, to the one that you gave earlier about Wales. Um, so- Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep pushing on the border, the border crossing uh, question for both Scotland and uh, Wales. Uh, I don't suspect anybody's jumping on a flight or a, a ferry to, to travel over to Northern Ireland to do anything at the moment. So I'll just concentrate on Scotland okay. and Wales. Um, another one, why can delivery drivers still do in-vehicle work when I can't? Well, imagine that's going to be because you're a sole occupant in the vehicle. That's one of the major factors. And that, will exactly, that will exactly be the pushback is because they're the yeah. only person in the vehicle. So the risk is not as great as it would be. We've had it for, for riders as well. I've had somebody, Mark, who did they say it's OK for me to order a pizza and my Domino's uh, driver is able to deliver it, but I'm not allowed to. Uh, I think in a way, not devaluing the, this very ADIs, but I think rider trainers is probably a little bit more frustrated in a way because of that ability yep. to social distance in your work. Correct. correct. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, motorcycling is the epitome of social distancing. You know, we're in, we're in completely separate vehicles. So, yes, there's, you know, there's a lot of a lot of thoughts behind that but you know the, the 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 rules are unfortunately the rules and there are a lot of questions coming in that are saying you know i've, I've got a pupil ready for test on or who's got a test booked on the second third or fourth how do i train them in in the meantime mm -hmm. i'm afraid at the moment the answer is you can't um and you might want to think about moving their tests um you know, it's not something that we want to be in the position of doing, uh, but you know that 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 is the the dictate from the from government, and we've got to follow it. I do, I've seen somebody raise the other specter of taxi drivers, um, as I understand it, because obviously we deliver quite a lot of uh, taxi testing to local authorities. As I understand it, you know, new licenses for taxi drivers and taxi testing is suspended we would only we would only be able to provide it if there was an urgent need and we had you know permission as it were from dbsa or the local authority um but yeah taxi drivers is a good example because they have got human beings in the car with them as well um, i'm not necessarily sure what they're saying about uh, taxis not being uh, used at the moment taxi drivers not being able to drive i think that will be a local authority decision because licensing to suspend or, or continue it is the decision of a local authority it's devolved from the center a couple of interesting questions that we've had. Um, will theory test deadlines be extended? Um, I'd like to probably have had your guests that say no, mm. um, because they can't. Uh, it's a, a legislative. And, 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 and the same them. question, the same question, Olivia goes for will CBT certificates yes. be extended? Uh, again, that isn't going to happen because that will require a legislation change, yes. and that's not going to happen in the four weeks. No. Um, just just keep going through your questions here. Um, yeah. Somebody's uh, commented that theory tests have already been sent at an opportunity to rebook, but when they went in there, there was no theory test to to rebook. So yeah, I don't think that any of this is going to go smoothly, folks. I think we're going to find that there's going to be emails, you know, being sent out saying here's a new practical test date or here's an opportunity to book a theory test. And if you don't like the practical test date or you're trying to book the theory test, you go in and you find there's not much availability because we weren't even dealing with the backlog from the three month lockdown, national lockdown, and we go into another one. So yeah, it's going to be a, a very bumpy ride in, in terms of availability, I'm afraid. Paul asks, will PDI licenses be extended? 
Um, good question, Paul. We can only ask DVSA on that point, and I'll certainly put that to them in our FAQs and our meeting with them tomorrow. So hopefully, um, you know, we, we, we seem to be apologising for a lot for the information we can't give tonight, but hopefully if you join us at four tomorrow, not only should we have more answers, DVSA will be there uh, to be grilled as well, so they should be able to answer some of these things directly as well. Yeah, someone's asked, uh, will the DBSA make the wearing of um, face coverings compulsory when uh, give training? See a number of my people in the area do not. I find it very frustrating. I mean, at the moment in England and Wales, it's for testing, yes, but for training, you know, it's advised, you should do, yes, um, but it's not a legal requirement. Obviously, uh, Scotland, that information has changed very recently where people will get fined if they're not wearing a face covering, if they don't come under the exemptions, um, so hopefully that will answer your question. It is something which, when you are working in that close proximity to people, even though you have got that ventilation, you should still have that face covering on to prevent any any um, sort of aerosol coming um, into contact with anyone else. Um, so yes, absolutely, people should do, um, and that's one of the many control measures people should take. I mean, obviously, there's medical exemptions, um, and we do we do respect that, um, but I think. You have to take from Scotland introducing it as a mandatory requirement that the U well, the rest of the UK will probably follow suit from that. It just takes a little bit longer for you know uh, regulatory uh, changes to be made, and there's obviously consultation to be made with you know different stakeholders to ensure that we're not compromising anybody's mental health, physical health, or civil liberties by enforcing on these things. So, um, but I'm not gonna drop down dead with shock if we see that enforcement in the UK as well, um, because it's it's the 80-20. There are the 20% that will very aggressively uh, write to us about the fact it is in the front of their civil liberties, and I, and I do respect your opinion, but then there is the 80% who genuinely do believe that if we all as a community wear masks, it is doing something to at least help control the spread of the virus as well. So, you know, um, yeah, don't be surprised if that comes in in the next few weeks here. Um, Chris is asking, is tomorrow's NAS meeting being broadcast? Yes, it will. It will be recorded, so we'll be able to do um, afterwards like this one will be it will also be streamed from the dia facebook site as well so we'll shortly be sending out invitations to uh, dia members and obviously njc and msa will be inviting their members to to come on to that one too Yeah, uh, that's sean sean makes a good point i totally understand on why there are so many issues with the dvsa during lockdown one, but I hope that they've learned and moved on for lockdown too, to give a better level of guidance to the profession can be just that. Are they understaffed? Oh, um, when I look at my small but perfectly formed and enthusiastic, hardworking band of employees, I would not argue that other organisations are um, understaffed because we managed to deliver an awful lot for, for, the, for the people power that we've actually got. Um, I think, I think you've got to always remember as well that DVSA are an agency working over multiple uh, in remits. It's also the old VOSA, isn't it? So they've got all the other MOT and vehicle inspection stuff that's still really important in terms of road safety going on as well. However, being a communications person by background, having worked within government communications, um, we all, you know, I, I was very vocal last time that the communications were not as good as they could have been. You know, number of bodies on the ground doesn't, you know, equate to a better or worse service. It's what you do with the resources that you've got. I will say in the defense of the people on the ground, as it were, at DVSA, who do the communication stuff, um, that uh, they do do a very good job in, in trying to keep us informed. I know from personal experience, it's a very frustrating job that you want to get things out there in a really timely manner to people so they're informed, because knowledge is power, right? But unfortunately, not everybody in your organization, including senior management, or including people as far up as the cabinet office, can move as quickly with you because they've got multiple people asking them to sign off multiple communications. So that's why things are slow sometimes because it's not just up to the comms team. It's not even just up to DVSA. It's up to DFT. It's up to even number 10 to say whether communications are cleared or not. And it takes a long time to get them done. But I do believe that lessons have been learned. 
I have been very clear that sometimes even if you just send a communication out that recognizes people's concerns and assuring them that you'll get back to them in a timely manner, that is better than the vacuum of silence that we experienced that time. And I do passionately believe that. We still get some jokers who email us and say, when we send out reassurance communicators, well, that was a lot of good use then, and why did you bother sending that? Because 80-20 again, the 80% appreciate to know that we are thinking about them and we are working hard to get them information if you don't like the fact that we haven't got that information immediately but we're trying to reassure people you have the opportunity to unsubscribe from that e-newsletter or, or find the information from somebody else on facebook who is an absolute expert and has all the information but for the people that do want some level of communication i think dia and the rest of us and DVSA, even when we haven't got information, should still let people know that we're there and we're trying hardest for them to get them the information and be responsive to your questions and concerns as well. But I will always be on the back of DVSA and they know that and you know that to make sure that when a communication should be out there and there's no excuse that it shouldn't, that we should have it in our hands so we can share it with you or they should get it directly to you not always stopping to ask us what we think. It's important to consult with us, but sometimes there are stuff that is so necessary to get out there. Just get it out is, is my opinion on these kind of things. So shall I move on to some financial things? Is that helpful? And then we can you know, revisit at the end any questions that we haven't um, answered. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to the latest update on some of the financial support measures. Um, there was the news in the last 24 hours that government support for the self-employed, the self-employment income support scheme, will now be extended to the 30th of April 2021. So they'd already announced a change to the third phase of the size, which was that they were going to increase the, the amount of grant available. And I'll, I'll go through each phase now um, in very brief terms, just to remind you of what the previous phases gave and what the, the, most, the next two, the most relevant ones will. But that is some good news at least that they're going to continue the self-employment grants until April, 2021. So that effectively means there's 12 months worth of support over a period covering 14 months. I know it's not ideal, but at least there's been some level of, 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 of extension. Um, each of the four lump sums grants represents three months of average profits. So there's going to be 12 months when this is all over and done with, hopefully, that cover the 1st of March 2019 to 30th of April 21. Grant three is set to open for applications on the 30th of November and will cover the period from the 1st of November 2020 until January the 31st 2021. So that's grant three that they've announced that they'll increase the amount of when they were originally going to reduce the amount in, uh, in that one. How much you get a lump sum covering 55% of three months worth of average monthly profits. Um, this is made up of 80% of average monthly profits in November and 40% of average monthly for December and January. We are going to do a mailing recapping the latest developments of the financial support measures uh, later on tomorrow. So this, this more detail will be, will be we, we, we're given to you then. I would say for the third and the fourth grant, eligibility is getting stricter. The previous grants, anybody could apply whose business had been adversely affected by coronavirus. Um, now they're going to, you must declare your business has been impacted by reduced demand due to COVID-19. So not just that you've been affected by coronavirus in general terms, it's being able to demonstrate that you've been impacted by reduced demand from your services. So this differs from grants one or two. Um, so it means, for example, one way you can't, you know, eligible is you can't make a claim on the basis you can't or couldn't work because you were self-isolating or shielding. So there is differences in the eligibility for the third and the fourth grant. In summary, um, the pre grant four, that will be available from to cover the 1st of February, 2021 until April 21. So recognizing that even if we unlock the country tomorrow, we're still catching up on all the lost business and lost income of the first lockdown still. 
Um, that grant, and at the end of uh, January or February, I believe, um, the government has not confirmed the amount that that grant will be, but the cynic in me says it'll be less. Um, and they haven't confirmed the eligibility, but just that's just to let you know that a fourth grant is on its way as well. Now closed are grants one and two. So those were the ones that were available from 13th of May to 13th of July, and they were made up of 80% of three months worth of average monthly trading profits. And grant two, which closed on the 19th of October, um, which was allowing for 70% of three months worth of average monthly trading profits as well. So in the third grant, I've just uh, highlighted that you've got to check the eligibility criteria carefully because there is some new terms in the eligibility, but the rest of the eligibility terms will apply from the last one. So things like you must have filed a tax return for 2018, 2019. Somebody has asked the question, as you move into the later grants, the three, grant three and four, would they not consider your 2019, 2020 tax return because you're moving between tax years? That's a point that I'll seek clarification on as well. The eligibility criteria also remains that you must earn 50%, more than 50% of your total income from self-employment. I know it's, it seems incredibly unfair, for those people on that one who are already drawing down a pension or earn more than 50% of their income from something other than driver training. But obviously these grants are being provided on need for people who have no other source of income really to go to. They don't, they're not drawing down a pension. They haven't got other income to rely on as well. I know it's also incredibly unfair on those people who've been trading for less than, than 12 months as well. So, But there is lots of information online about the latest round of, of grants. And I would particularly recommend you look at Money Savings Expert for very clear and simple and understandable explanations of all support available um, as well, because Martin Lewis, you know, he does a very good job in that respect. So that's the latest update on the size grant as well um, and on the money saving expert there is a lot of guidance as to what the different criteria are too um, what I'm very pleased to, to say is that lobbying of ourselves and other business leaders in other sectors about the fact that in November the minimum income floor was being amended for universal credit which would in effect made it difficult for self-employed people to utilize that source of benefit um, that had been opened up because of COVID. They're not gonna make those changes now till April, 2021. So the minimum income floor will not affect this. So you can still continue to make universal credit applications. I know it is not a huge amount of money, but if you combine it with other schemes, it might just be enough to keep the walls from the door, um, you know, temporarily at least. So you still can apply for that as a self-employed person and it doesn't impact you having the size as well. There is some things that experienced ADIs who've been through this process will already advise you on about, make sure you time your universal credit application at the right time so you get your last month of that um, and you get your grant. But um, you talk to people like uh, the Citizens Advice Bureau and the Money Advisory Service who are more expert in financial advisory uh, on things like benefits for more information on, on that as well. But again, Money Savings Experts got some very good and pragmatic advice on universal credit as well. Um, you may qualify for benefits as well if you're sick or self-isolating. Clearly, one of the risks of self-employment is that lack of a, uh, you know, sickness payment or uh, you know, support for being off ill um, that you would lose when you come away from a traditional salary to post with an employer. Um, because of the various contact tracing systems, uh, test and trace in Scotland, Wales, and uh, in England now, there are new staff support allowance uh, grants available, ESAs, that may be available for people to claim for a number of days of sickness if they are identified as having been exposed to COVID and must isolate or they have been given a positive test for COVID as well. So do look into as well, whether you would be eligible for some of the benefits that are being paid. It, again, tiny, tiny amount of money, but better in your pocket at the moment uh, than, than someone else's. Um, 
So have a look at that. On driving.org, more support for businesses. So just go to driving.org and, 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 and search for uh, our news pages. And we'll send the link out in an email about financial advice tomorrow. There is lots of advice about financial support and we're updating that as we receive it as well. So that's just a bit of a roundup um, for the, the latest kind of developments on the self-employment income support grant and that news that they're not going to alter the minimum income floor on universal credit, which means you are still eligible to apply for universal credit if you're self-employed ADI. Our um, information online also talks about the tax uh, break, so the deferment of payments into next year and things like that. In previous emails we've sent members as well, we've also talked about talking to providers of everything from mortgage to car lease, car loans, um, and utilities providers. Um, I know that the Treasury and other people like Federation of Small Businesses and ourselves have been lobbying that we see, you know, banks, building societies, and other providers of things like utilities look at whether they can still continue to offer some level of payment holidays um, or, you know, delayed payments with no fees or, or penalties. Um, so you know, keep your eyes peeled or speak to your specific provider to see if there's anything they can do for you if you're in financial hardship um, at the moment, which, you know, quite frankly, the, the entire industry is as well. But individually, you can speak to those providers and see if they're going to be able to do anything to support you with deferred payments and payment holidays and things like that. Is there any burning questions on either the financial elements or anything to do with testing and training that we haven't answered yet or we haven't clarified or was too confusing because again, I just crack on at a bit of a garbled pace. Um, I'm not seeing anything that's standing out to you, Olivia. No, nothing, nothing that's um, that we can actually answer now or stand, yeah, or, or standing out. You're right. Um, Obviously, um, it's um, people who have like a, a limited, um, they're a director of a limited company, things like that. Um, we know that, um, I don't believe that they can claim or they weren't able, eligible in the first place, I don't believe. No, it's, there's, yeah, there's, the, the self-employment income support scheme. Go on, Mark. Sorry, there's, there's one that keeps popping up is, can we still teach family members of the same household. I think you answered that one a little bit earlier on, Carly. If, I don't know whether you want to just recap your thoughts behind that one. Um, as far as I'm aware, obviously you can have family members or people of the same household in a car for travel purposes, but I think the recommendation is that we limit our journeys to work journeys and journeys for essential supplies as of the last lockdown. So yeah. that's why I really want to get some advice from DVSA to go out to pupils and parents saying, you know, do think twice about doing, I mean, time of is really important, so it's really, it's really tricky, but but uh, we've, if we're all coming together and, and following the guidelines and trying to keep everybody else safe, it does seem compromising if we're having people to go out to do private practice when we're telling people that they can't go out for other journeys as well. So I think we'll have to get some advice from DVSA on, on teaching people from the same household at this time. So I know there are ADIs who've got their own kids that they want to teach or family members. So we, we do need that advice for them as well. We also got to consider if you're going to go and do that, um, then seeing your car, which may be liveried up out and about training people, you know, what that's that what might look like to others as well. So um, it, it's it's your call if you are able to do that. You've got a, you've got a target on your bum there. Haven't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah target on your bum really, haven't you, with, with, with your top box on at the moment. Um, yeah. But yeah, we'll, we'll try and clarify that and ask that question DVSA and hopefully get some advice on that tomorrow as well. Um, a question from Richard, just nipping back to financial stuff. I'm over 70. If I was to decide to stop, not until uh, spring, would I still be eligible for self-employment scheme? I, I, I'm not aware, there's no age bar, as far as I'm aware, on the self-employment in income support grant at all. So I don't think you should worry necessarily about that. Um, so I think, we, I think we're getting there in terms of answering the main questions. Sorry we haven't been able to answer everyone's questions today. I can see there's lots still coming through. 
Um, we'll again revisit most of these questions tomorrow. So sorry if it's a bit repetitious in our, uh, you know, one with, with DVSA, but hopefully they'll be able to give you some more direct answers on your questions and be able to clarify things for you a little bit better. So just to reiterate, the team will try and get an email out this evening, if not tomorrow morning. We will be meeting with DVSA at 3.30 and then 4 p.m., we will start a webinar like this. So you should receive an invite from your NAS member association shortly. And we'll also stream it live as we are doing now from the DIA Facebook site as well. So that's a second bite of the cherry on the Q&As there. But in the meantime, do keep sending things through. We'll collect, we're will collect. we collecting them all on a big spreadsheet so we can keep asking DVSA for questions in the meantime. I'm just refreshing my email uh, as I speak to you. So uh, chat amongst yourselves for a moment just to see that I haven't got any more updates or there hasn't been a DVSA direct go out in the uh, interim whilst we've been speaking to you. Um, I don't think there has been anything go out, but keep your eyes peeled because either tonight or tomorrow morning, there will be some more DVSA directs going out about both the theory test and about the uh, practical test as well. So in the meantime, all that remains to me is say, sorry we're in this situation again, folks. Hope we can be as helpful as we can be and let us know how we can be of more help to you at this difficult time. We'll keep trying to communicate to you as frequently as we can and as much detail as we can, but keep on letting us know your questions so we can put them up to the powers that be. Um, and I hope you and your family stay safe and well in the meantime. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for listening. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.